Hey everyone, John Pike here with the Talent Genius. Today we are going to cover an incredible topic. A topic that is probably perhaps one of the most important for business entrepreneurs and owners. It is how do you with laser like accuracy select the right person. You have a whole bunch of people come in and interview, they say similar things, but how do you know with a high level of degree of confidence that the person that you're going to hire is actually the best person for the job? We are actually going to t take a look at the assessment profile of someone with not one day of experience in sales, but yet in his first 30 days on the job, he had a total of 15 listings out of 20 total appointments, so a 75% close rate. And uh, what's awesome about that is he, they also put 10 of those 15 homes under contract within that same 30 days. That's incredible. So I'm excited to see this. Everyone, I'm Frank with Viral Marketing. I helped John put these on. I'm really excited to see this because we're all looking for really good uh, sales talent for all of our companies. And it sounds like this is someone that came up from no sales experience, just had the right characteristics of the profile? Correct. The right blend of personality, motivators, and most important of all, talents. Now, most of you watching today will probably see uh, seem that this is an anomaly because it's, it's outside of your experience base. How can somebody with no, no experience Nope, I think we're losing you, John, because you're on that wireless connection. you got to be on a wire connection, buddy. I think we might be losing John, everybody. That's all right if we are. You like John? Yeah, well, I got to tell you, if you're watching this, you know, John Pike is a... Uh, is fantastic. He's been working with all these top agents and business people from around the country, you know, assessing their hires, you know, and, you know, 20 or 30 of these profiles come in, and you're able to pick from those profiles who's the most likely to succeed at what they, at what that is they're going to be doing, which is usually a sales position. And what's really interesting about the profiles is it really measures two things from what John told me is someone's self-awareness as well as their authenticity. And the closer the match you have between the self-awareness and the authenticity, um, the more likely that person is going to succeed. And this is a very in-depth assessment. I took it took me about maybe an hour to take. And it really tells you what you're strong at and what you're not. And if the strengths line up to what is pretty typical of someone in a very growth mode sales position, um, you know, you do well. So, John, are you back? We got your, uh, your uh, hangout working. You're, are you still on wireless for us, buddy? Uh, interestingly, it asked me to install plugins midstream right in the session. So sorry about that, folks. No, no uh, worries. I was just telling I was just telling everyone about what you what you do and how the assessments measure um, how they measure self awareness and authenticity. Okay, is that correct? Yes. In fact, that's a great a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. So this individual working for Mark Spain um, really didn't know what he didn't know. In other words, he doesn't have one day of sales experience, never had any classical sales training, and yet he's a closet salesperson. So interestingly, this happens more often than what you would think, where most people, they, they go through the traditional route, they get a college degree, they typically change majors throughout their college history because they're not really sure what they want to do. What we know from, from statistics is that once you graduate, most the vast majority of people take a career or a position that has absolutely nothing to do with their college education. Then in addition to that, throughout their career, they typically change jobs every th three years to try to find the sweet spot. So what I can tell you categorically is this new listing agent uh, on Mark Spain's team has now found his sweet spot, un unquestionably. How old is he? Uh, he is probably, let's see, he's probably 28, 28, 30 year, to, to 38 years of age. Sure. You know what's interesting. In addition to to uh, having 15 listings in his first 30 days, the first five months, uh, or pardon me, the first three days of July, he had five listings. So this guy is actually is absolutely on a tear. So the most important concept behind this, yes, he's had tremendous outcomes and, and short-term success, but how do you viewers? How do you replicate that? How do you institute that? Uh, or implement that within your own organization. So first of all, uh, what I'd like to show you, one of the three uh, profile instruments that we use is the DISC profile. Okay, So what you can see here, 
And I really want to want to draw your attention to the strength or the the D score. I have looked at literally hundreds and hundreds of buyer's agent, listing agent um, profiles, and it's the exception. It's very rare that people have a high D score. What I'm normally seeing is about a 35 to a 45 D score. Now this individual happens to have an 81. Okay, that's kind of almost double what I'm seeing in terms of the average. So oftentimes I get asked, Frank, is there a difference between the disc profile for an ISA, an inside sales associate, uh, a buyer's agent, or a listing agent? And my answer to that is this. The listing uh, agent is more transactional. It's more the thrill of the hunt. There's a lot less consultative and time that goes into meeting with each individual customer. So the higher the D score, the more someone has a higher sense of urgency. They're more concerned about volume than they are about in terms of quality and less numbers. So that's a better fit if for a listing agent if you have a higher D. Okay. Similarly, with an ISA, due to the volume of calls that they're expected to make, having a higher D score than 35 is also preferred. In fact, one of the previous interviews that we did with um, Mark Z's uh, superstar ISA who booked 23 in-person appointments in one week, her D score is even higher than this person that we're, that we're actually looking at today. So I don't see it nearly as important for a buyer's agent. In fact, um, it's probably even better that they have a lower D score because they're not, they don't have so much power and pace that they're coming across as being pushy or, or overbearing. Okay, so again, we take a look at the their D score. He's an 81 on the sense of urgency, and then for I, he's also very expressive. He's actually in an ideal area because he's a 67, so he's moderate. So those of you, those agents that have that are what I would call a pure I, a pure extrovert, their tendency is to dominate the conversation, to fill in any empty holes, a pregnant pause. Uh, but what we know about sales is that the key to sales is about asking the right questions, building trust and rapport, and uh, really being likable and believable. So, to summarize, this uh, this person here is exceptional from the standpoint that the D score is very strong, and he also has uh, a healthy I score, which is moderate. Now, most of the time when you're looking at the disc profile, people are high in two dimensions or above 50 and understated or lower in the other two. Now in the case of this person, he also has the added benefit and bonus of being a 67 in terms of his detail orientation. Most of the time, Frank, great salespeople, their Achilles heel has to do with the details, being thorough, precise, paperwork, administration, and that's why to leverage the, the talent of salespeople to the fullest extent, having somebody support them and handle the paperwork and the admin is absolutely the best call because you want to have the person spending more time interacting with customers and doing what they do best, which is converting leads and closing listings and closing sales as opposed to doing the actual paperwork. Okay. So, ideal disk profile, it's rare. I would say the total population. Um, Maybe, as far as D, high Ds are concerned, you're only looking at maybe 5 to 10% of the total population are a high D. Which as is far over, as I, over 50%, you said? What's a high yeah. D? Yes. Yeah, you'd be looking at anywhere from kind of north of 55, okay? 55 or higher. So you're looking really for a, you know, a rare individual. Not only that, you're also looking for somebody who is very extroverted and a high I. And about 25% of the total population are extroverted or a high I. Okay? So, again, the reason why this person, I believe, has really crushed it, in part, one of the leading indicators is because, from a personality point of view, he has a very high sense of urgency and he is also very amiable, outgoing, and expressive. Hmm. Now, how's the, how's that the job is, Pardon me? How's, how natural the set the one in the lower right where it says natural what's the difference between the two of those okay it's a good question so the other thing that we measure not only the top graph is the the real um, 
it's the that's real who he is him. naturally in his natural that's state. That's who he is, uh, you know, at home in a social setting. That's what we call his comfort zone. Now, if we take a look at the lower right hand corner, that is the work him. This is who he perceives he needs to be in order to be optimally effective. Okay. Sometimes the assumptions that people make in terms of what they need to do or who they need to be in order to be the most effective isn't the right assumption. So in this case, you can see that he elevates his expressiveness, which I believe is the appropriate thing to do because you're interacting all day every day pretty much with, with, uh, with potential buyers or clients. And then his D-score, he lowers his D-score. So I think it's more important for him as he's, as it, as in terms of relating to people to be amiable and expressive and friendly. But as it relates to sense of urgency, because only 5 to 10% of the total population are a high D, he has to lower his D when he's actually interacting with people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's too much force. It's too much competitiveness. It's coming across as being impatient. Uh, because high D's like you and I know because we're both 99 out of 100, classic entrepreneurs, right? We want things done yesterday. We're very impatient. So in this instance, he's, he's actually modifying upward on his expressiveness and downward on his urgency. However, he has the drive innately built in in terms of his personality style at an 81, which means as soon as he's finished that appointment, he is, he is on it. He is to the next appointment. He has a high sense of urgency. He wants to get things accomplished versus somebody who's a low D, has a slower pace, and has a lot more, um, has a lot less competitiveness or sense of urgency. Interesting. Now, how much, how much of this assessment, by the way, is of all the things the assessment measures, which is like three components, how much of the person is their disc, would you say, of the total uh, factors? Well, I would say since there are three different assessments, I mean, you know, you could look at it as each of them being kind of a third of the piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the reasons that um, DISC is a good starting point, but the problem is that it's one-dimensional. It only mentions personality. There are so much more involved, which is, which is what we're going to get to. So that's why so many people, if they're just merely looking at DISC, they're going to get burned frequently. Okay? But I would say it's probably 20% of the total mix in terms of the decision. 20% out of 100. 20% out of 100 in terms of the three, the three actual tools. Okay, great. Okay. So that brings us to, unless the audience has some questions, please feel free to post them and we'll answer them. We'll do our best to sure. answer them for you. For those of you that are listening live, let's take a look at the second profile. The second profile has to do with what is it that is someone is motivated by? What are their drivers? Okay, And I have seen this to be one of the most important um, tools for measuring consistent high performance. Okay, So first of all, I'm going to mention the, the, the two that are the most important. Economic. In other words, show me the money. So all motivators are not created equal. If you have somebody who is highly economically motivated and they have a good personality style or, or behavior style for sales, then they have a much higher chance of performing consistently at a high level. Now, let me give you an example. We conducted an extensive research study. It was an international study. We took a look at hundreds of salespeople and we tried to find out what is the one characteristic that most of the top salespeople, the number one salesperson, at over 300 organizations, what did they share in common? You know what it was? It was high economic drive. They're motivated by money. Okay, So we know that there's a, a statistical correlation, a direct correlation between people who are highly economically motivated and success in sales. That's one of the key factors. The second key factor is the red graph that really is a measure of two things. Number one, the strength of someone's achievement drive. How much get up and go do they have? How much will they assert themselves to be number one? How much do they want to be in the limelight? How much do they strive to, to rival uh, their peers and surpass their peers and be the best that they possi possibly can be? That, If you have a high score as well with that, those are the two most important 
motivators or drivers for sales hands down. In fact, let me be a little bit more specific. Of all of the thousands of profiles and companies that I have worked with, um, the top 10% of the sales teams that I've worked with have an average economic drive of 86. The average of the achievement drive of the top 10% is 60. So these metrics give us a, a, a great comparison. Anytime you're looking at a new hire, how closely do they mirror or how accurately do they match the top 10% as far as economic drive and achievement drive. Now, let me also mention a couple of other dynamics. The individualistic, as you can see, which is the orange between economic and political or achievement drive, that has to do with how much someone likes autonomy and freedom. Freedom. Now, as you know, the majority of real estate agents are 1099 people. Okay, so um, they're not employees. So, what's good about this is it tells us how much someone will be self-directed versus whether or not they like to have a lot of hand-holding and a lot of support and a lot of help. Okay. The other two things that I'll just bring up briefly, one over here which stands for regulatory, that tells you how much they will follow rules, policies, and systems. If they're low on the regulatory, it means that they're situational, that they have a tendency to, to, to believe that the rules are meant to be broken and that uh, the end justifies the means and they'll do anything to get the business. So they can be a loose cannon or a maverick, so you've got to be very careful. Someone like that can get you into some trouble. Last one I'll mention is theoretical. I like to see someone that has an average or above average learning, appetite for learning. In other words, they're intellectually curious. Now I know some of the folks that I work with, some of the, the entrepreneurs, some of the brokers, they prefer to hire people without any industry experience. In other words, they don't want to inherit any bad habits. They want to teach them their way, their system. They're taking heavy hitters, phenomenal salespeople from other industries. And let's face it, I have proven this over and over again, not only in my own personal life, but also in the life of my clients. A person's, what they did for, for sales is irrelevant. If they have a pattern of success in multiple industries, there's, a, there's an exceptional correlation between that and doing exceptionally well in any industry. Okay, so first assessment that we look at is a person's personality style. It's one of three key indicators. It's about 20% of the decision. Okay, the second one in terms of uh, taking a, a person's drive or motivation, which has to do with primarily economic and also achievement, I would say that probably makes up. Um, if I'm just taking it, I've never had anybody actually ask me that question, Frank. It's a good question. I probably say. Maybe it's uh, 30 percent or 35 percent. Okay, so uh, then the the final part that we're going to go to is actually it measures someone's talents. Okay, now for the purpose of this graph here, one thing that I want to emphasize with the the horizontal line that I have that I have uh, put here is that a six on this profile actually equals an 80 percent, not a 60 percent, an 80 percent. So the higher the score, the better. Okay. Now normally, in an ideal world, all three assessments are a strong A. So in the case of this person, his disc profile is unquestionably a strong A. His motivators are actually an A plus, very rare. And then his talents are what I would consider to be probably a B or a B plus, okay? Because he has one of the three scores over here is a six, it's not an eight. Now to put this in perspective, less than 10% of the people that take this third profile are 7.9 or higher in all three dimensions of people, getting results, and planning, okay? so. In an ideal world, again, I like to recommend primarily people who are 7.9 or higher straight across the board. So you say, well, John, why did you make an exception? Well, the reason I made an exception in this case and recommended that this person be interviewed is because his first two profiles are so strong or so good that if he has a little bit of a, of a compromise and the score is not as high in terms of the top 10%, an 8 in terms of his people talents, 
he's still is somebody that 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 should be interviewed. And that's so what people, I did. Empathy. Let's go with those again. Empathy is people. That empathy is that. people. That's your innate you ability to, to connect and relate and build trust and rapport. Then getting results. The second, the second category has to do with getting things done or getting results, and the third category has to do with problem solving and planning. Now. To go into more detail, this profile also tell, takes um, all of the 78 different attributes that we measure, the third profile, and on one of the pages, it actually breaks down in terms of the six steps of the sales process, how do their scores rank from prospecting all the way to closing and everywhere in between. Now you'll notice that the the difference in terms of the scores the average of these six categories for this person is a 7.1 I believe the top 10 percent of salespeople that I have measured the average is a 7.8 so he's still in the top 20 percent but on his talents his innate ability to do things well he's a little bit lower than the top 10 percent so I actually gave the feedback in the interview pay special attention to how closely or how well he builds trust and rapport in terms of how he answers the questions the content of the answers and just overall your general gut instinct about how you feel about this individual in the interview and the reason I did that is because his scores were 20 percent lower than what I would typically recommend but nonetheless remember a six equals an 80 percent so folks, we are taking the creme de la creme. We're basically panning for gold. We're looking for a unique combination of personality style, a high D, a high I. We're looking for a high economic drive and a high achievement drive. And then we're looking for people that score in the top 10% in terms of their innate talent. Now, Which is the average of all those sales process, 7.9 or higher for top 10%. 7.8 is on page the page 60, which measures you know prospecting to closing and the six steps of the sale and mm -hmm. then about a 7.9 on the top three areas of empathy practical thinking and systems judgment now I know this is a lot to to take in the first time that you're looking at this on the very last page of this profile we actually give you an expanded view of the empathy practical thinking and systems judgment so there are 78 different attributes or talents that are covered here what we're looking for is patterns and themes to determine what does this person do innately well. So let me take a time out for a moment. I want to measure. I want to mention something that is a, an absolute game changer, a total breakthrough in sales performance. I can tell you categorically that my peers absolutely despise me because I am what is called a contrarian. Most people are thrilled to take everybody's money and to treat everybody the same and to put a sales force in a room for two or three days and to give them sales training guess what that doesn't work I used to be part of the problem in fact I worked for the largest sales training company in the world globally and and found out firsthand that the sales training after the training the high performers continue to be high performers and the low performers continue to be low performers and to even further validate what I'm telling you in an economic downturn, you want to know one of the very first things that senior executives typically cut? It's that traditional sales training because they know deep down it doesn't deliver results. If the sales training delivered results in an economic downturn, they would double and triple their efforts and spend more time on skills-based training. So you say, John, well, where are you leading me to? What I mean to tell you is this, is that most important of all is someone's innate ability to do something extremely well maybe average or not well at all and this is why this profile of the three profiles is the most important and why it's an absolute breakthrough because it measures things like persistence self-starting capacity the ability to handle rejection self-confidence problem solving the ability to connect and relate to others those are not things that you can learn those are things that are innate now something else I want to mention when I have trained sales forces, let's take a, a recent one, 150 salespeople, the top 10% of the sales force had a 57% average sales increase based on being exposed to the sales training and the sales content that I gave them. 
the remaining 90 percent all right had an average sales increase of nine percent so you had a 6x growth rate in your top 10 percent being exposed to the same training at the same place at the same time hearing the same message so in the case of this person that works for Mark Spain he is a natural born salesperson not one day of sales experience not one day of training in sales when you or I or he is exposed to some sales training because of the fact that the hardwiring of the brain gets the things that are necessary to be a high performer in sales he is going to have a 6x growth compared to the average salesperson who perhaps doesn't have as strong a personality style doesn't have as strong a motivators and certainly probably doesn't have as strong of a talent base so um, that's a, 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 a very significant difference than the message that most coaches and consultants and training companies are telling you you give me all your salespeople and I promise I'll give you an increase in sales it doesn't work folks so not everybody is created equal as it relates to sales and um, and therefore your treatment of your reps should not be equal John, I got a question. Give, yeah go ahead I, I, got, I got a question for you and this is more conceptual Sure. So as I've been listening to these, and this is some fascinating stuff, what would stop someone from saying maybe running national ads all the time for salespeople, and just having them running them through this assessment? I mean, how many like if you were to run ads on Monster.com, Indeed, Craigslist for a sales position, and you were to filter all those people, all those applicants through this assessment, um, how many assessments would you probably have to look through to find someone that had a high D, high I? Um, as well as a very high economic and political drive, right? As well as someone that scored 7.8 or higher on average of all the prospecting abilities. Right. How many would I have to look through in your experience? Well, 1 in 10, the, 1 in 20? The answer is, that, yeah, what, what's interesting is sometimes we, we hit it within the first five applicants. Another time, it may take 50 applicants. So it just depends on a number of factors so but if you're taking a look at a hundred people I would say within that you have ten people who are game changers ten people who are consistent rainmakers they're gonna consistently overachieve their results let me give you an example I just did a team call yesterday with a team and this uh, one lady that I interviewed and spent time with reviewing her profile as results and creating a one-page summary and strength plan for her talents were in the top one percent okay similar to the inside sales associate with Mark Z outstanding her D score was a 35 so she was a buyer's agent not a listing agent in this case she sold 55 homes in her very first year with no real estate experience whatsoever well her D was low but her what were her character her what talents the, the, the and value economic drive I believe if I remember correctly was in the 90s so, so the economic drive was in the 90s and the average of all the sales skills was a 7.9 or higher it was actually almost close to 9 it was one of the highest I've seen in a long time so that's interesting with a 35 D huh well see that's the thing Frank that I'm seeing which is very interesting now sometimes there are there are nuances from industry to industry that are a little bit different now the average D score of the top 10% of other industries that I have assessed is actually I think it's a, it's around 60 okay so that's 25% off so you know what's interesting is I have consulted with many buyers agents who kind of feel a little bit inadequate that they don't have a higher D score and they're saying John should I be more aggressive should I be more um, more ruthless yeah <laughs> and I'm saying you know absolutely not okay part of the reason that that person is so successful is because her style is very conversational it's not high pressure it's very consultative and she has a genuine desire to help people and that that really comes through so in her case one of her strongest motivators in addition to economic drive was a genuine desire to help people so that's not something that she's having to fabricate it just comes through as a natural expression of who she is so it's kind of interesting. I've had three different buyers agents with three different teams in the last week ask me the same question. 
should I be elevating my D score as a buyer's agent? And I'm saying, no. I want you to be authentic to who you are. You're outgoing and personable because of your eye. You have a moderate amount of, of sense of urgency. Remember, only 5 to 10% of the people in this total, total universe are a high D. So what's going to happen if you're too much of a high D? It's going to disconnect with the majority of the population. Okay. So again, most people make uh, decisions, purchase decisions, based on how much they like, believe, and trust the person that they're dealing with. So one of the things that I teach uh, out of hundred over a hundred sales training programs that I personally attended, I created my own, and it has to do with how to identify the different buyer styles. Are they a high D, are they high I, or both? Are they a high S or a high C? Because your conversation and communication sounds a tremendous, is, is significantly different than if you're talking to a high D. Does so that yeah, make the sense? Driver, expressive, amiable, and analytical. Analytical is the C, right? The accommodator or someone who doesn't like a lot of change. Things, someone who likes you know, predictability and routine. Believe it or not, that makes up almost 50% of the total population. And then the I is the expressive, and the D is the dominant or decisive. Yes. What about what about validating these assessments? So I would assume at some point, you know, you'd, you'd sit down, you'd have this information, and then you still would ask questions, and you would interview to go a little deeper on certain things. Could you maybe share with us, from an interview standpoint, of maybe how you would go about interviewing someone to validate the results of this assessment, based sure. upon what you've seen? Right. Well. For those of uh, the, the folks that work with me, I actually provide them a list of questions to ask. Uh, one of them has to do with actually conducting a role play. Uh, so I'll give them a pen, for example, and I'll say, this is a magic pen. All right? Tell me this pen. In other words, this pen can be any pen that exists today. Your job is to try to figure out and find out what it is that's important to me, what I value, and what type of a pen I would buy. Remember, you have the pen. It's a magic pen, so it, it can morph into any any pen that you know the one that I want, the one that I'm looking for. So here's what happened. Here's what happens, probably more than 85% of the time. A person will start asking. A, they'll start looking at this pen. It's tactile. It's in their hands, and they'll say, um, "Do you?" If the pen is black, they'll say, uh, "Do you value a black pen?" Right? They'll start talking about what's in their hand. In other words, they're giving me features specific to the pen. They're not asking me hardly any open-ended questions about. So, so I forget about the product completely, and I'm and I'm doing a role play with you. Say, Frank, um, what's what is the primary application that you're going to be using the pen for? Is it for contracts? Is it for special occasions? Is it for something where you need where you it's like to have signing wedding invitations for my wedding in May? Okay. So, uh, what type of feel? What type of look and feel do you want to have in your pen? Do you like a fine it print? A, it needs to give me a feeling of romance. A feeling of romance. So you get the you get the idea. You ask open-ended questions to try to determine preferences, right? Right down to how much money they're looking to spend, to how it feels, to whether it's thick, whether it's thin, the type of 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 uh, whether it's a fine point or or medium, a rollerball, whatever it is, and then. If if most people will slaughter this role play, okay, they just are completely at a loss. Mm -hmm. What I like to then instruct the people to do is to say, okay, look, I'm going to give you a second chance. We're going to do this again. What I want you to focus on now is I want you to ask me open-ended questions to try to identify what's important to me. Which is when you think about it, that's what sales is all about. It's asking great questions, right? Mm -hmm. So and then give them a second opportunity. But but let me let me reinforce something here. Just the vast majority, I would say almost every hiring manager that looked at this guy's resume with zero sales experience, zero sales training, would have discarded it and immediately put him to the side. And yet he is phenomenal. I had a situation about a month ago where somebody interviewed um, this young lady, relatively new college grad. She was a waitress, okay, as green as could be. Doesn't have a whole lot of life or work experience. She mentioned several inappropriate things in in the interview, like she was in an abusive relationship, um, and some other things. However, her assessment was in the top five percent. 
she doesn't have any clue or idea because she doesn't have self-awareness about what she's good at and where the application of what she do, of what she is capable of doing is best. She is an absolute rock star. Even though she has very little life and work experience, even though she's coming through a, you know, a stressful relationship, and even though she's only, I say only, stereo, we have a stereotype in terms of what people do for a living, a, uh, a waitress. So I'm saying that to say this. I don't want to see a resume. I don't want to talk to the person because I do not want to be influenced one way or another by anything else other than the numbers because it's a proven statistical science. So you don't look at the resume at all? I do not. No. Now, now, sometimes some of my clients will ask me, John, here's the person's background experience. Um, can you give me a little insight? And they, you know, we collaborate a little bit and I'll, and I'll ask them a few questions and give them some ideas and so forth. But as far as my, I'm concerned, I do not want to see their resume because I have proven categorically your work experience, irrelevant. Your education, irrelevant. I can't even begin to tell you how many times the number one salesperson either has no college degree or had no industry experience and yet the vast majority of the time, I'm not saying entrepreneurs like, like brokers in real estate, I'm talking about executives at the Fortune 1000, they have in their head that they have to have industry experience. They have to have this. They have to have that. Throw all those preconceived notions out. You take a look at their success rate. Only in this country, 20% of the salespeople sell consistently 80% of the total sales volume. So one in five salespeople sell 80% sell of the total volume. And our success rate is, is, is no better than it is uh, today than it was 40 years ago. It doesn't need to be that way. There is a new scientifically, statistically validated set of tools that are proven over many decades that helps you to close the gap and virtually eliminate the frustrating costly guesswork. So no res this is interesting. So where did you find I mean where do you go to get the leads in the first place of potential sales candidates to give this assessment? Uh, it's a good question. So let me mention two two main avenues. Number one, you're looking at job boards. Now, don't just go to a job board, a single entity like CareerBuilder or Monster.com because it's one-dimensional. It's only one specific website. What I recommend is use a, use a service like ZipRecruiter.com. I even had somebody reach out to me because I've been referring them so much from the company. But here's what they do. They're a job aggregator. They send the person's, they send the ad to about 30 different job boards. So you get more visibility in terms of the opportunity. So you want to cast the largest net, try to get the biggest message out there to the most amount of people that you have a job opportunity and have the most amount of people take the assessment. So now the challenge is sometimes a broker may live in an area where um, they're drawing from a lot less, a, a less population. Let me give you, for instance, right here in my own market, Jason Bramlett ran the ad just as I told him, used the copy I gave him, and basically got nothing. Another client, exactly the same situation yesterday. So what Jason Bramlett did is he diversified a little bit. Now let me explain. Most of the time, people that are looking on a job board are either disenfranchised and unhappy with their current employer or they're unemployed. That's basically the segment. That's not to say that these disenfranchised people are not good people because we have hired some exceptional people. Most people are disenfranchised and don't enjoy their job. But how about this? What Jason Bramlett did working together is we actually um, created an ad that we put on the radio and he has hired six buyer's agents in 60 days and I have three more to analyze in my inbox as we speak. So sometimes you have to use a different medium to reach a different target audience. And if you think about it, the people that are driving to and from work, right? Um, if they have know jobs. somebody that, pardon me? Have jobs. Have jobs. And if they hear of an opportunity and it's a well-written ad and it clearly was, they're going to let anybody that they know Right, that's a real estate agent know about that job, or the person may hear it themselves. But oftentimes, the pe the best people are the ones that aren't looking. But you tweak their per their their curiosity, and um, 
and you get some pretty significant results. So, you know, there's the, there, there's the traditional online avenue, which I always recommend you do. And um, then there's there's radio as well. There's another venue. Uh, so in the case of uh, a team that I worked with yesterday, they had 35 people apply to an admin position. From that, we whittled it down to a short list of four people. They interviewed all four. They went with the two people that I recommended that were the strongest. I had a team call with them yesterday. They actually gave me the feedback. They're, it's the best administrative people that they've hired in the history of their company. So this is a game changer. It really works. Nothing is ever 100% frank, as you know, but this is about conservatively 80% accurate in making sure whether it's a transaction coordinator, whether or not it's a executive assistant or a buyer's agent, a, you know, an ISA, a listing agent, that we make sure that we have the right profiles for what the job demands. So how do you come up for, with what the job demands for a company? So if I was looking for a, a runner, you know, what would the right profile be for that? Well, that's a good question. Just by simply collaborating and asking some questions, finding out how much they're interacting with the with the general public. Uh, what are the main tasks involved? Um, you know, things. There are some universal things, however, that are going to be consistent regardless of the position. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember. Here's why interviewing is such a a challenge. More than ninety percent of what it takes for a person to perform is hidden from the naked eye. A lot of the intangibles or what I call the internals like persistence, self-starting ability, you know, their detail orientation, how much pride they take in their workmanship, okay? How much they enjoy the job, how much they're how well they're able to handle stress. So it's interesting you should ask me that question. You you asked me about a runner. I recently helped one broker hire a chauffeur. I thought I've never heard of it. I thought it was brilliant. I've never heard of any other broker. Okay, let me just talk about this for a second. How much downtime d does a person have having to drive to and from appointments? So she has a person that drives her everywhere, and while she's in the car, she's working nonstop. She's mm -hmm. actually got everything she needs right there in her mobile office, and she's got a, a guy that's basically driving her everywhere that she needs to go. Brilliant productivity, right? Yeah. But again, um, I just simply ask them, what is it that you're looking for? Not just a, a person that has a good sense of direction, right, and a good driving record. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you're looking for? And we, we talk those things through, and then we make sure that we screen accordingly by looking at the assessment results. And I want to say, if, um, we have a nice little Q&A app here on the Hangout. That If you have a question for John, you can type it in the questions box. And it will pop up over here, and we can ask him, and you can get get a get an answer to a question if you have one. So go ahead and use the, uh, the Q and A box if you have something you'd like to know more about. Um, should we talk? Maybe could you share a little bit about what you'd recommend for onboarding, or once you actually do make your hire, that transition to the company culture, or maybe anything that you would know to speed up productivity once you actually hire the person, based on your experience. Sure. Um, I want to be clear to kind of separate this from a sales pitch because I, I want this to be educational, so I'm not saying what I'm going to say next to, to sell my wares, but I want to share my experience. So please take it from that standpoint. Every client that works with me, typically within the very first week that someone's hired, we walk them through their assessment results and we tell them specifically why they were hired. Okay, now you think about that and contrast that to the, the, the typical approach is to say your prayers and take your vitamins and hope you know, that they make it through that probationary period for the first 90 days. So here's the difference. We have such a high level of conviction and confidence that the person is, gonna, is a great person and will perform at a very high level that within the first week we say, here's why we hired you. It's not a matter of if you're going to be successful but how successful with our support you are going to become. We talk to them about their personality style. We talk to them about and we walk them through their motivators. We take a look at their innate talents and we say, your talents are exceptional. right? Your motivators are ideal for this position. 
you are in the zone when it comes to this position. This is the sweet spot for you. And so when we do that, the typical response is, I wish I, the amount of people that have said to me, John, this is one of the most powerful personal and professional development episodes or sessions I've ever witnessed. I wish I had access to this information 25 years ago. It would have changed the course of my career. So, you know, what's interesting, on the last interview that we did, which is on my website with um, Fred Holmes, he had a guy that had been consistently performing at about 24, 26 transactions per year. I looked at his assessment and it was incredible. And I said to the guy, I said, with the type of results that you have and the type of profile that you have, you should be making over $200,000 conservatively. Well, we kind of went our way, never really thought anything of it. This is over a year ago. And now Fred gave me the feedback, I had no idea, that he's on track to sell four times what he has consistently sold over the last many years. He's on track to sell over 100 homes. So here's a guy that has the capability. All he needed was somebody to tell him how good he is and show him and give him more encouragement and confidence. So what it does, Frank, it helps to affirm and encourage the new person. It also helps for not only the manager or leader or, or uh, uh, the owner of the business to know with laser-like accuracy their style, how they like to be communicated with, how to create the ideal work environment in terms of what motivates them, and also what activities to give them because it's in the sweet spot of what they do best. So instead of who are you, do I like you, do I trust you, is what you told me in the interview accurate, what you're doing is you're accelerating how good they feel about the decision that they made to be part of the company. They get great treatment. You tell them exactly why they were hired. For the first time in their life, they're told, here's why we hired you. Here's how good you are. And then the, the owner shares their assessment results, their one-page summary that I give them. Here's my style, by the way. Here's how you connect with me. Here's how you best communicate with me, um, and so forth. So you develop trust and rapport right from the very first week that develops a stronger bond. Forget about that 90-day prob probationary period. They're going to start to become a high performer right away. That's totally great. different than just... And the reason why nobody else is really doing this is because they don't have a high level of confidence that who they're hiring is the right person, is a great person. Yeah, they also just don't know this information. This is no. not common knowledge at all. But, but here, you know, now I'm starting to almost be like an evangelist. People call me a sales evangelist because I am so passionate about this. It's coming through, I know, just in this interview. Absolutely. And again, people don't know what they don't know. So what happens is people have been jaded taken advantage of over time. They've heard all these different sales pitches from all these different providers and all these different solutions that are out there. And so what happens is, is people become very callous and very indifferent and they almost roll over and give up. They know how important it is to make a good hire, but they're like, well, what do I do? I haven't found anything out there that really works, that truly works. Well, it's a whole new day, my friend. Uh, this is a, this is a, based on some of the technology we have there's no excuse for not being able to hire a, you know, great people. I just love the idea, I'm just sitting here in my head, of, of using ZipRecruiter. So the ad I would write is, you know, I would say, I'm looking for this type of person, I would assume. Right. So right. it's not really, the, here's what you're going to do. It's like, I'm looking for this type of person with the, the characteristics of a high D, right. characteristics of a high uh, I, and maybe some C in there. And then right. who wants to earn some money finally. And right. want to be the best they could be in political traits. Right. Um, that also, um, you know, under you know, how how would you what would you write in a job post that would uh, attract someone that scored a seven point eight or whatever higher on all the all the sales parts? What would you say right. there? Well, is there anything to say that kind of to, attracts that individual? You have to remember what is it that that the top Salespeople value. Is it well? From what I've heard, it's money, 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 and recognition. Money and recognition. So many of the ads that I that I write have to do with do more of what you love and what you do best, which is converting leads and selling, and less of what you don't, which is paperwork and administration. Yeah. So basically, the idea is spend more time face to face, right? 
converting leads and closing and making more money than having to deal with this necessary part of the business, but we'll handle that for you. Which is the whole team concept in real estate. Which is the whole team concept, yeah. exactly. So you're not just selling them on the opportunity, you're selling them on your company and how you are structured. Now, not every entrepreneur has their company structured in such a fashion where they get unlimited leads, for example, where they get extensive administrative support. So it may be a little bit more difficult for those people to attract the top 10%. But many of the, of, the, of the owners, the broker owners that I'm working with have exceptional systems, right, where it's, it's centered around the most important person in the company and I'll, I'll say it again and again and that is the salesperson, okay? Because mm -hmm. nothing happens unless something is sold. Yes, you no. have to support, but at the end of the day, there are two challenges to every every company: sales and everything else. Right? If you don't have the sales piece down, we're talking about building a world-class sales force based on science and statistics that's proven and time-tested, that's been on national television, right? That's had all these impressive results, no matter what the industry is, because we eliminate the guesswork. So that's that's basically that's basically what it is. It's, it's, it's great, man. So, you know, you, you had the ads online through ZipRecruiter. You had maybe a radio ad, which I think is fantastic. I always love uh, recruiting from colleges and speaking at college classrooms. It's always been a good uh, strategy for me. Um, then someone responds to the ad. They put their name in. You, you have a lead, right? I'm interested. Here's my resume. You, you reply to them saying, that's great. We'd love to hear more from you. We're very excited to learn more about you. Here's a link to the assessment, right? right? And then they take the assessment. You get it back. You look for the whatever it is that you're looking for like we discussed today. Right. And if that's a fit, you bring them to an interview where you validate it. And then uh, after you then what about ref what are your thoughts on references? Give me your give me your take on the concept of maybe going three deep on a reference where you call one reference and you ask that reference for reference and you ask that reference for reference. Well that's probably the only way you're gonna get the most candid and blunt feedback, which is what you need. It's I would say for them yeah, I mean, people that are good, who's going to give you a reference that's not going to give them a glowing reference? Nobody. So, you know, well, you're that's worth like libel or litigation if you don't. Yeah, you know. absol absolutely right. Ab you cannot, you are prevented from law, otherwise, you're going to get sued. Yeah. That's another good anyone, point. Anyone calls me, I'm like, not my problem anymore. They are great. That's Man, right. Fire them. And, and, and as a result of it, most people that are in the know will just give you a generic answer. Yes, all I can say is that, I, is that they worked here from here from here to here or they were a good employee or, or maybe they won't even give you that. And that's you, why I you mean, need… Do you, do you check references on these hires? Like how, how much of that is – is it even – it sounds to me like the assessment almost negates the even reason for a reference check because it's still the characteristics of the individual. People think I'm creating – you know, it's heresy to, to say that, but I would, I, would say, I would say you're right. I would say you're absolutely right. It's a total waste of time, time and effort. Remember when we interviewed um, um, Kevin Yoder, who was spending weeks, right, frustrated because of trying to get in touch with all these people to do reference checks. The amount of time it, it was taking for him to do it, oh, it was terrible. So here's another concept. I've shared this before, but let me share it again in case this is the first time you're watching. Hire fast, fire fast. You've heard hire slow, right? Fire fast? No. That's not right at all. It's hire fast, fire fast. You know what gives me a lot of personal satisfaction? The fact that, if I could be so blunt, that we're mowing the lawn of all these big corporations who are totally asleep and out to lunch and are basically just using so-called sophisticated resume software screens to determine whether or not they're going to bring somebody in to interview them. So. From my experience, there are so many talented, great people out there. It's just that nobody knows they exist. And there's no one knows how to really, identify them. And they don't even no know mechanism. themselves because no one's, no one's taught them. Yeah. It's funny how the guy went you know, four times production just because you made him more self-aware that he could do it from the assessment. Right. So Which let me just mention, almost everything I do has a scientific and statistical bent or bias to it. So we gave this same assessment that we've been talking about today to over 200,000 people in 23 countries, every industry, every role, every position, every level, entry level, all the way up to CEO, everywhere in between. We asked one question. 
the single most important breakthrough question for human capital, HR, and companies in general. Why is it some people consistently perform at their peak with less effort, mind you, and the vast majority achieve far less? Even though they have a similar educational background, even though they may work in the same department, they're achieving far less. So, first of all, that there were an elite top 9%. These 9% achieved all of their performance objectives in a one-year time frame. That's how we measured peak performance. They had to have achieved all of their performance metrics in a one-year time frame. Most of them did it quickly and very easily because it's a natural expression of who they are. Now, it took us seven years to crunch all the data, right? Almost a thousand resources, people in the trenches, in the field, conducting the interviews and doing all of this work. What we found was, was very intriguing, very interesting. There are two common characteristics of the elite 9% and they're this. Number one, self-awareness. In other words, the people who perform at a high level have elevated insight and knowledge about who they are, what's important to them, what their personality style is, and most important of all, where their strengths reside. The second characteristic of this elite 9% is what we call um, authenticity. So it's interesting in Latin that the word authentic means to create. So when you are authentic to how God has uniquely gifted you and given you the talents, and your personality style, you are able to create the kind of life that you want to create. It's, it doesn't feel like work anymore, Frank, right? Because it's a natural extension of who you are. You're in the zone. You're in your element. Do you realize that less than 17% of the total workforce actually get to use their strengths the majority of the day? So what happens is, and I speak about this internationally, the, the topic of employee engagement. Employee engagement is a pandemic. Most people are just put one foot in front of the other. They don't enjoy what they're doing. They know they're not even very good at it, but because they have commitments, right? The vast majority of Americans, I think it's something like 85% of Americans, some recent research said that they're just barely making their their monthly financial commitment. They're living check to check, paycheck to paycheck. It's, so it's interesting. You, it's it's a concept of you if you work for money or not. Like I would have to say I don't work for money really, and that's not why I work. Right. You work reasons but you're saying the majority of people you know you have to go to work because you need the money that's right they're stuck right they know that they're not very good at what they do and so um, but yet they risk averse and they don't want to they want to branch out but you think about it um, every three years uh, the older generation changes jobs today the recent college grads every 15 months they change jobs Think about the tremendous cost in turnover, in training, in onboarding. Why? Because one of the reasons is, there's many reasons, but one of the reasons is they simply will not tolerate poor treatment, right? They're very fickle that way. They'll jump and they'll do anything. They don't care, right? They'll just find something to fill in the, in the pieces, right? But uh, they're more explorers. But at the end of the day, most people's self-awareness is very poor, their self-insight, self-knowledge, they don't know what they don't know, so they're powerless to do anything about it. And incidentally, that's why most training, traditional training fails, is because if you're just going to throw them in a room and give them a whole bunch of content without any blueprint or diagnosis of where are they today, right, how much value is training going to be? They don't know what to do with the training, where to apply it, what they need, what's a benefit, where they're weak, where they're strong, etc. So, yeah, the, um, the, the assessment tool is a very powerful for selection and recruitment. It's also incredibly powerful for personal development and for coaching. John, we got one minute left. How does someone get a hold of you and what do you do? Yeah, you can reach out to me. Uh, the best way is to just to go to my website, which is thetalentgenius.com. It's thetalentgenius.com. My email and phone number are listed there. Um, that's, that's the best way to get in touch with me. Great. Well, everyone, thanks for uh, attending the Hangout, and we plan on doing these once a month. We'll interview the same thing over and over, interviewing some rock star's profile and finding out what makes them well so we can kind of break down common themes. I find these very fascinating. John, thanks a lot for your time today. My pleasure, Frank. Thank you.